Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here. Perfect. Yeah. Got it. Uh, so, I mean, we're just going to continue this theme of basically that our unwanted sexual behavior is not random. Uh, it's a direct reflection of the parts of our story that remain unaddressed. And so, uh, I mentioned this a little bit recently, or in the uh, main stage, but I did research on about 3,800 people, uh, basically created a self-assessment survey uh, for people to fill out that basically got into your relationship with your mom, your dad, uh, formative experiences that you went through, like trauma or sexual abuse. Uh, and then I asked about what were people dealing with in the present? So that could be anxiety, anger, depression, uh, just a lot of lack of purpose in life. Uh, and I'll be talking about that more in the afternoon breakout, is what's the current, how does your present day life actually shape your sexual fantasies. Um, but this one that we're going to be talking about today is much more on childhood. So we put all that into in basically an assessment, had a team at New York University handle all the analytics because I have no PhD research background. Uh, and that's what we found is that basically the specific search for terms that you put into the internet, fantasies that people pursue, infidelity, buying sex, these things actually aren't random. Um, and so what that, I think, means to me specifically is that our sexual fantasies are nothing to be ashamed of. They are, in fact, our greatest teachers. Um, and this is a radical kind of different orientation of just trying to suppress, to stop. Um, but it's actually to say, listen to your lust. And I have an exercise that if we get to it, it's great. Otherwise, you can just do it in a small group uh, at home if you want to. But I know one of the things that we kind of deal with a lot when we first start thinking about addressing our sexual brokenness and exploring these areas is just shame comes up pretty quickly. Um, and I get that shame is really powerful, but one of the things that I have found is that the reason why shame is so powerful is because its power is derived from our flight from it. Um, and one of the things that I explore in my book, Unwanted, how sexual brokenness reveals our way to healing. Quick plug, I publishers shift a lot of books here. Um, so if you want to buy them, buy them for a friend too. That would be awesome so I don't have to take them back on a plane. Uh, but one of the stories that I explore in that book is uh, there is this guy named Andy Casagrande. And he is the videographer, the cameraman for the show Shark Week. Uh, have you guys ever seen that show? Yeah. Uh, so Andy basically gets in the waters with great white sharks. And he was once interviewed and they said, Andy, what in the world do you do when you're in the water with a great white shark? And he said, it's really, really counterintuitive, but you swim directly at the shark with the camera. And what he says happens is that when uh, you're swimming at the shark, the shark comes up, it's really curious, it bumps its nose against the camera lens, and then it quickly realizes that this is not food. Yeah. And so if you're a great white shark, you're used to everything in the entire ocean swimming away from you. But what Andy says is that if you don't act like prey, they actually will not treat you like prey. Yeah. And to me, that has a lot to teach us just about our great white memories and our great white stories in our life, is that so often the power of those stories is really derived from our flight from them, and that it's in turning towards the things that we feel shame and letting other people know where we harbor it that we actually find freedom. And we see this concept at work in Numbers 21, where basically the people of Israel are in the wilderness. They are grumbling. They are complaining. They are kind of yelling at God and Moses because they have terrible living conditions. They have airdropped rations of manna that are dropping down from heaven. And they start grumbling. And then, does anyone know what happens next? Snakes. So all these serpents come, and they start basically eating the people of Israel. And all these corpses and dead bodies are piling up. It's a really disturbing passage. Uh, and so Moses hears the lament of his people, and he petitions to God to basically give us a solution. And the solution that God gives is basically to take a bronze serpent, plop it onto a flagpole, raise it up, and then when the people have been eaten by the snakes, they are to look at this bronze serpent, and they are healed. So the Gospel of John picks up on this again in John 3.15, where it says, just as, the son of, just as Moses lifted up the rod in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up in order for people to be saved. 
And so this is the principle at work, is that when we look at the very thing that is killing us, we are saved. Um, when we look at the one who bears the curse of shame on our behalf, we are saved. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be inviting you into, is really to turn towards the things that maybe for your whole life you've either tried to suppress, get accountability for. Um, I'm going to have you eventually write down some of the specifics. Um, because again, as I've stated earlier, our fantasies are one of the greatest teachers that we have. Um, so to do that, I'm going to just kind of tell two brief stories about men who have done this work uh, and the freedom that they have found in doing it. So the first man's name is Jonathan. Uh, and Jonathan is a professor. I'm making these stories up, um, but you know. Uh, Jonathan is a professor at Florida State University. Uh, he's been married to his wife for eight. You know Jonathan? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying what department he's in. Um, but he's been married to his wife for about 18 years. They have no kids. He's actually uh, the chairman of a board of a local nonprofit that addresses youth homelessness. Um, and he was recently in a uh, doctor's office for a routine physical. And while he was getting this physical, he told his doctor that it would probably be a good idea to order a sexually transmitted infection test. Uh, the doctor had some good heads up and said, do you have anyone to talk to about this thing? Uh, and that's where I got the referral. So started working with Jonathan. And one of the things that he opened up to really early on uh, was that he said, I love the adrenaline of buying sex. Um, but one of the things that I do is I drive around the streets and cruise around the streets of downtown Tallahassee, Jacksonville, wherever I can drive within three hours. Um, and my favorite part is trying to lock eyes with a woman on the streets. And he says, once I get those eye, that eye contact, I'm done for. Um, so he really wants to change, but really has no idea how to do so. Second man's name, uh, we'll call him Phil. He's in the Seattle area, uh, was involved at a kind of large church in the Seattle area, and he was about to get engaged to a woman that he was planning on marrying, and she discovered pornography on his phone twice. And that very quickly eroded their, her trust in the relationship. Uh, he was really devastated, but then got an amazing opportunity at Amazon uh, and started you know, dating other women, but what he often found is that within about a month or two months of dating a woman, he felt really smothered and felt like he had no freedom, and that was always the context that would trigger his pornography use. Um, and so when I asked him to kind of share some of the specifics of the pornography he looked at, he's like, nothing violent, I want something that's consensual, and he said, if I'm honest, I probably drift off into mother-oriented porn. Uh, so if you don't know, Pornhub actually keeps data on everything that we're watching. Uh, Mother-oriented pornography is always in the top five, stepmom, MILF, all that kind of stuff. So um, he was really intrigued as to why that was happening for him. Uh, so those are the two kind of presenting stories. Now what I'm going to do is just uh, to kind of tell you some of the key childhood drivers. And then we'll kind of work the story together. Sound good? So, uh, and I'll try and fly through these. Again, my book kind of goes into these things in much greater detail. Uh, but the first kind of key driver from childhood was basically a family that was very rigid. Uh, Patrick Carnes, who's kind of the father of uh, sexual addiction, would say that 78% of people struggling with unwanted sexual behaviors come from some family struggling with uh, rigidity. So this is a family with lots of rules, lots of regulations. Rules are weapons here. Um, and so if you grow up in this family, there's a lot of cruelty. There's maybe one parent, could be a mom or a dad, that rules with an iron fist. Um, and so as you're kind of going through this type of family, what I really want to underscore here is this is the birthplace, this is the origin story of anger. Because you're watching all this hypocrisy play out, but you're powerless to do anything about it. So one of my clients was kind of watching porn. His dad had seen his internet history. Um, again, uh, hit him, and then told him to go to his Baptist church to confess it on a Wednesday night service. And so, so much shame, so much rigidity around that. And so what I want you to underscore again is that 
you know, it's not just lust, it's anger. So I'm going to be talking a lot more about anger in the next session, but just to kind of view it as two tributaries coming together, lust, anger, into the river of unwanted sexual behavior. And when you grow up in a rigid family, pornography is actually one of the greatest things that you find because you're like, finally, escape. Finally, I have something that I can just get exactly what I want when I want it. No one else interferes. I have my secret haven here. So that's a rigid family. Uh, second key driver was that of a disengaged family system. Uh, Patrick Carnes' research found that 87% of people struggling with sexual addiction come from a disengaged family. Uh, so this is when care is overlooked. So when you think about some of the most significant stories that have shaped your life, when you think of, I mean, middle school is a prototype for hell, right? Uh, my, my nickname is Donut. In middle school, I was physically, emotionally, I mean, my, my body was abused during middle school. And so when you begin to think about those stories uh, and you have your own stories of heartache, who was there to actually be attuned to your face to say, Jay, Jim, Graham, something in your face looks different today. What happened? Um, when you were going through formative stages like puberty, we know that your body, when you're 13, has about like 200 parts per whatever measurement of testosterone. By the time that you're 15, that goes up to 1,200. So that's like going from a shot glass to a pint glass of testosterone. You are going to want to masturbate to everything and anything at that point, right? But so many of us grew up with so much silence in our families that we were never prepared for our bodies. We were never taught healthy things. And so this disengagement becomes normative for people. So people find that intimacy is not found within the family system, but it's found outside of one. And so you end up scanning your life always for someone else to get a look from someone, to be able to get some sense of connection, but then you actually don't know how to build intimacy with people because you've never had that modeled for you. And so you go throughout life kind of just wandering, looking for a speaker, looking for a affair partner, looking for someone to help ground you. And then you also find that no one is able to do it. Uh, the third key childhood driver is that of triangulation. Uh, and this is really emotional enmeshment. So uh, what I often say is this is like when you're married to mom. Um, and so the classic situation of this is uh, you know, there's a, there's a father who is pretty involved in his career, pretty successful, maybe travels a bit on business, uh, is basically attending to a lot of things. And he might look like he's a really good man at home, he provides for his family. Uh, probably a lot of us in this room fall into this category. Uh, and yet he has abdicated emotional involvement and deep intimacy with his spouse. And so what happens in the spouse, with the spouse here, is that she has a hunger for love and for connection and realizes that her husband is removed from the family. He's not emotionally available. So she brings so much of her desire for connection to a son, to a daughter, and that's where the place of intimacy goes. And uh, Pat Conroy has an amazing quote on this. Page 51. So this is uh, in Pat Conroy's The Prince of Tides, and this like just nails triangulation. A portion of guilt is standard issue for Southern boys. Our whole lives are convoluted, egregious apologies to our mothers because our fathers have made such flawed husbands. No boy can endure for long the weight and magnitude of his own mother's displaced passion. Yet few boys can resist their mother's solitary and innocently seductive advances. There is such forbidden sweetness in becoming the chaste and secret lover of the father's woman. Such triumph in becoming the demon rival who receives the unbearably tender love of fragile women in the shadows of the father's house. There is nothing more erotic on this earth than a boy in love with the shape and touch of his mother. It is the most exquisite, most prescribed lust. It is also the most natural and damaging. And so what you learn here is that uh, I need to be emotionally available to my mom 
all the time. And then my dad might come in and say, Jay, thanks so much for how you've done the dishes. Thank you so much for how much of a caring, godly son you are. Thanks, Dad. Um, and so what ends up happening is that you feel this inner ambivalence of, I want to be free, but if I am free, then that means I'm going to disappoint my mom, disappoint my dad, and everything begins to crumble. And so again, this is the beginnings of unwanted sexual behavior. This is the beginning of pornography, that you might repeat some of the themes that you've learned how to do with your mom, but then it gives you the surrogate sense of freedom from your family system. But at the same time, you feel like if my mom, my dad finds out about what I've done, I'm going to be eliminated and thrown out of the family system. So you are in a terrible bind if you are triangulated. And I would say that almost all of us have some level of triangulation in our story with our mom or with our dad, where basically they wanted us to be something of the surrogate comfort and they wanted to confide in us about some of the difficulties they were going through. Uh, the fourth and final one that we'll talk about today uh, for key drivers is that of sexual abuse. Uh, and when I talk about sexual abuse, uh, before I went to grad school, the image that always conjured up in my mind was like this kind of white Dodge Ram van <laughs> uh, with some kind of creepy guy. Uh, and yet what I've learned both from clients and just the research is that almost 90% of everybody who has been abused uh, knows their perpetrator. So more than likely, your perpetrator was a mom, a dad, an uncle, a brother, a sister, a babysitter, camp counselor, a youth pastor, a priest. Um, and so trust is almost always the paradoxical foundation of abuse. And the reason why this is so, so significant is, again, if your family system is rigid, it's disengaged, you have no one that really loves you, pursues you, and so guess what that abuser's first move is going to be? Hey, Jay, you have a phenomenal arm. You could probably be an NFL quarterback. Really. Um, hey, Jeff, um, I know that your parents don't really let you play video games, but I have this new Super Nintendo system, and it's phenomenal. Why don't you come over, and we'll just hang out. Um, and so what ends up happening is that your body begins to feel what's called oxytocin, which is bonding. So if we hug someone, uh, if we have an orgasm with our phone, we create oxytocin bonding with our phone. Um, and so what ends up happening is that you begin to feel the sense of trust. Um, I really like what I feel around this person. But then they start introducing you to sexual content. Maybe it's a peer that introduces you to pornography. Um, maybe it's a babysitter who invites you into seeing uh, something of her body that you've never seen before. And so what your body is feeling is, is arousal, right? Like that's the way that God has made our bodies is to respond to sexual touch, physical touch and pleasure. Uh, but then they make you kind of make sure that it's a secret. And this could be an overt threat or it could be just don't let anyone else know about our little bond. But every abuser, and here's the key point, wants your pleasure. Because the moment that you are intrigued, the moment that you orgasm, the moment that you uh, feel rest and allure about what they're showing to you, male or female, you are going to feel like something in you is complicit. You're not complicit, but you feel like you are the one who caused it, that you should have gotten out, and so this is where you begin to say, like, I should have known better. I should have just gotten out. But you can't ever go back to that initial arousal and begin to bless it. You instead curse it. And so what's formed in your earliest sexual template is that you feel aroused by things that create bonding, things that create dopamine, things that create cortisol, which is stress. And then you begin to feel shame and numb and secretive about everything that follows. And so guess what you're going to find very arousing much later in life? Something that actually recreates that trauma cocktail. And so this is one of the places that I get most angry about in Christian communities, is that we talk endlessly and endlessly about acting out. Um, but we never think about it in terms of reenactment, right? And so if you're going to spend your whole entire life trying to manage triggers, which is 
I know that's popular business, but I don't buy into it too much. I think you need to know your triggers and know how to work through them and to regulate your affect. But uh, so one of the things that my research found was that the most significant users of pornography uh, had sexual abuse scores that were 24% higher than those who did not view pornography at all. Um, and so a lot of times people think of sexual abuse as just rape or molestation, but I would also add the category of someone with more sexual knowledge than you introducing you to pornography as part of that abuse definition. <coughs> so those are the four key drivers, and now we're going to talk um, just about some of the backstories. So uh, let's talk about Phil first. So Phil was a success, Phil's father was a successful businessman was a deacon in his family church. Uh, and one of the things that happened when Phil's dad was traveling is that uh, Phil and his mom used to go out on Friday nights to Blockbuster Video. There's apparently, I just learned this, there's like one block, one or two Blockbuster videos left in Alaska. Just one, yeah. So him and his mom used to go out to Blockbuster like every couple Friday nights. Uh, they'd pick out a movie and then they'd go get Thai food. And what Phil described is he said, it always felt like I was on this like, date with my mom. Um, and she would kind of tell me, like, you know, it, even if you get married one day, um, I, I'm still going to kind of show up and you know, make sure you take really good care of me. Um, and one of the things that Phil um, wanted to do when he was little was to play baseball. Uh, so he had played some Babe Ruth leagues, and then when it came to high school tryouts, uh, he really wanted to do this. Uh, but his mom said this to him, what if you don't make it? That would just be the saddest thing. And so he talked to his dad about wanting to try out for baseball, and uh, his father kind of said, you know, your future is in academics, it's not in hobbies, and besides, mom likes having you around. Um, and so one of the places that Phil discovered pornography for the first time, at least in his memory, was that uh, it was the spring of his freshman year when a lot of his friends began playing baseball, and he took the bus home wishing that he was on the baseball diamond, and he said that that was the season when he began to lean on pornography most significantly. Uh, Jonathan's backstory uh, was that his parents were both successful lawyers. Uh, and uh, they took six months off when Jonathan was born, but then a full-time nanny was raising him. Uh, and what ended up happening with Jonathan is uh, he told me that two of his earliest memories were the first was being awake in a crib, uh, trying to reach out, call out for a mom and a dad, and having no one come into the room. His second kind of earliest memory was having the flu when he was little, and his mom was kind of pulling out the back driveway, waving, um, and he was left with his nanny. So uh, raised by this nanny, and then uh, in middle school, his parents realized that uh, Jonathan can probably be left on his own, he's going to be fine, and they gave him this uh, new red Schwinn bike uh, for his birthday present his seventh grade year. And he said, Jay, I used to ride that bicycle around everywhere. And I said, tell me about where you went. And he said, I would cruise around the neighborhood just trying to lock eyes with girls in my class or friend moms. And so what I kind of just reflected back to him is, said, Jonathan, you're using the same cruising language that you just used. Um, and then, Right around that time, his parents took on an international case in South Africa and Johannesburg, and they hired a basically a college nanny that was a friend of theirs to come watch him. And the first night that she was there, her name was Jen, college student, and she said, you know, basically, Jonathan, are you dating anyone? He's like, no, I've never even kissed anyone. Um, and he said that her laugh and her eyes on him were one of the most kind of searingly sweet things that he had ever experienced in his life. Um, and over the course of those next two weeks, she had invited him to uh, basically have his first kiss and also stole his virginity uh, by the end of that week. 
And so those are the backstories. So what, what I'm curious about is do you all begin to see some of the connections there between how our story is shaping our sexual brokenness? Just curious what you guys see. Question. Yeah. You said there were five drivers, and I got four of them. What I'm going for huh? the oh, rigidity, four. disengagement, triangulation, and sexual, sexual abuse. I would say trauma too, but it's yeah. Okay. Just don't have time to address it. Okay. Any other connections that you guys saw? The, you talked about um, complex trauma. The, the 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 person who initiates the sexual Invasion, I'd call it, you know, invading that person's yeah. face with a sexual thing. Yeah. That often is, maybe most commonly, is somebody they care about. Yes. And who they look to, yeah. to I need you to care for me. Mm -hmm. And so that um, there's this link between feeling guilty afterwards, feeling shame. Yeah. And now that makes any approach just. Mm -hmm. any, any approach to friendship, even here as, as guys, and it's, yes, we're, we're about friendship. Mm -hmm. And the risk out there uh, in the rest of the world where friendship is so rare, I yeah. how much role that plays. It's yeah. not sexual. Oh, yeah. It, but it, it still it, plays a role. Yeah, but then it's, it's asking you to trust again, which in all of these family systems, trust is the very thing that's severed. And so what ends up happening is that we begin to kind of pursue sexual behaviors that make us feel some level of shame and unwanted because that's, the, that's our origin story. And so that's what I would say is most people are not pursuing self-medication. They're not pursuing an escape. They're actually pursuing something that will reinforce judgment against themselves. And that's a really critical difference is that you're not pursuing something just to feel better. I mean, how many of us have known what it's like thousandth time we've looked at porn or had some season of infidelity, you don't feel great about yourself. And I would say that feeling like crap about who you are is actually the very point of your unwanted sexual behavior. Yes? Um, seems like there's one that's missing that I keep waiting to hear. Um, it's where you're in a family where sex is kind of, uh, or maybe your grandfather and your father and both grandfathers were womanizers. Mm -hmm. And uh, where sex was more introduced as play. Yeah. Where you see your father flirting with your aunt when the uncle leaves the room and you're going, geez, dad, you're flirting with, mm -hmm. with Aunt Betty, you know? And yeah, then, you know, totally. just left the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, absolutely. Uh, where he takes you to bars and his, his idea of a Saturday outing with your with his son is to go bar hopping, yeah. give you a couple of quarters to play the vending machines. And, yeah. and uh, he's flirting with the bartender or somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sitting, sitting and I would say that that's, a, that's... Hold on. Wait, yeah. And so... <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you turn 16, I mean, I have this 8 millimeter film on my 16th birthday. My mom, my stepfather at that point, and everybody else, and my older brother, they're all laughing, giving me a cigarette, a shot of whiskey, and my first Playboy subscription. Mm -hmm. And so sex to me was introduced as like... Uh, Hey, this is part of your 16 now, and you know, here's your first Playboy subscription. My mom didn't like get upset. It would come in the mail. You know, I, I'd read it. I'm reading about you know R I R I B A L D, ribald sex. Yeah. So it was a. Playful. Can I interject just for time? So that's a playful yeah. thing. So the guilt and the shame is yeah. just. Uh, Can I, I interject just for time? That was the dad's <laughs> worst nightmare. You yeah. did not want me showing up, picking yeah. up your daughter. So see, that's yeah. my yeah. shame is. I, I deal with the guilt of all the women that I've slept with. I'm talking about like 100 women probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I can't face my wife. I can't tell mm -hmm. after 31 years this is still my secret. Yeah. I feel like it's a block to the intimacy with my wife. It is. Also uh, a block as far as my maturity and having, because I'm still thinking of high school sex and college yeah. sex. And, yeah. and, and it's, that's my shame. That's my guilt. Yeah. And then that lust, connecting with women. Oh, I know your body type. I slept with yeah. you. You're fat, you're skinny. Can I interject now? Tall, short. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. to. So, so, so what I would say to you is that that is what you just described is sexual abuse. Um, when your father takes you out to that, grooms you for how to see women, everyone is complicit in the whole family to introduce you to porn. They want you, I mean, you're learning. 
there, I mean, if, if, you, if you grew up, like some of my clients grew up watching their dads be farmers, they're going to become farmers because they watch it. That's never told to them that this is what you do. You just watch by learning. And so that's what I would say is you were groomed to womanize. And so most of us as men have so much sexual debris in our life, like hundreds of women, 200, 300 women. Um, but most of us will never go back to those stories of how we were actually groomed and set up for that. Um, and that's, that's a lot of the process of confronting those things, being honest with yourself and with your spouse. And that's how we heal, is through confronting difficult things about our past and the decisions that we've made in the present. So what I want to kind of do, uh, just, I wish, we didn't, I wish we had more time, um, is, is to, I mean, what I would say initially is that we, uh, you don't have to do this alone. So just a quick plug for resources that I've created, have the book. I also created a self-assessment based in the research, so it's about 160 questions. You can go through it, and you'll get basically all the key drivers of your unwanted sexual behavior in your story, and then some of the core fantasy life that you have. So I don't think a lot of the data is going to surprise you, but what might surprise you is the connection between your story and your sexual brokenness. Uh, if you guys ever saw the film The Heart of Man, uh, it's yeah. on Netflix right now. We teamed up to basically create an online curriculum for churches, small groups, uh, just to really, and it's called the Heart of Man Journey. Um, and this is just something that we'll, through kind of 18 episodes will guide you to see how your story is shaping your sexual life. Um, so uh, as far as we get today, uh, the papers that I handed out are called, uh, it's basically listen to your lust. Um, and so what I'm going to have you guys do, whether you want to write it on your phones, just process, don't cheat, don't look at your neighbors. <laughs> um, but what I'm going to do is to kind of invite you to consider your sexual life as a house. Okay, so it's late in the evening, um, and you hear that familiar knock of lust. What are you going to do? So in the past, you may have tried to put a surveillance thing around your home to make sure that nothing can, can get in. Uh, other times, you may have tried to call a phone, a friend, uh, for backup. Uh, other times, you just let the intruder come into your house and ransack various rooms of your marriage and life. Uh, what I want to propose to you is something very counterintuitive, that you actually go out onto the front porch and you acknowledge the presence of your lust. And you begin to ask it questions. Why are you here? Why is it that I have been sabotaging so much of my life to you for the last 15, 40 years? Um, what is it that you have to teach me? And so what we see in Romans 12 too is that Paul says basically don't be conform to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we really cannot renew our sexual mind if we actually don't know what's inside there. Uh, so what I want you guys to kind of ponder over the next few minutes is just what is your current unwanted sexual behavior? Uh, and you can write that down if you know it, but this one should come pretty quick. Uh, so this is use of porn, hookups, infidelity, uh, sleeping around, but just begin, and again, I know that shame factor, intimacy, you don't have to write it all down now, but I want you to really think about that. Um, second major category would be, I want you to write out in detail what your sexual fantasy is. So in Jonathan's story, we saw that his sexual <coughs> fantasy really had to do with locking eyes with someone uh, and getting involved in... <coughs> women and prostitution's lives. Uh, for uh, Phil, a lot of his sexual fantasies had to do with kind of porn and milk <laughs> pornography. Um, so I want you to kind of think about what are some of the specifics that you actually put into the internet? What type of woman do you normally, or man do you normally pursue when you think about a sexual fantasy? Um, what's the scenario? Who's in charge? How do you want that whole thing to go? Um, and write those things out. Um, and so that's going to kind of be very counterintuitive for a lot of you to consider this, maybe for the first time. Uh, so that's the core fantasy section. And then uh, 
Next, I want you to write out and list out uh, basically three areas of childhood pain. And don't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but just begin to think about them pretty rapidly. When you think about some of the core wounds of your life, what are they? Uh, was your father distant? Uh, was there a scene with your mom where she was really cruel? Uh, I want you to think about a story with both a mom and a father, um, or mother or father figure, um, and just begin to think about what are some of the key wounds in my life. Uh, next, I'd want to ask you guys to think about your childhood longings. Uh, so these are some of the deepest desires of your heart. Maybe to, um, you know, want to be a baseball player, want uh, some type of woman to choose you so that that reflection of who you are, uh, that if you had this kind of gorgeous person, then that would reflect positively on you. But really tap into what's, what are the longings of your heart? Because as Dr. Thompson said, most, most of us ha have not really considered what so many of our longings are. Uh, and then I want you to pick one of those specific stories uh, from the worst childhood moments and then write out the story. Uh, so this is 600 to 1,000 words. Uh, and I want you to include conversation, time of day. It could be like a dinner table meal that maybe you saw someone erupt, uh, but it, to basically illustrate some type of childhood dynamic. Uh, and then I want you to reflect. So reflect on what your core fantasies are. What do you notice about them? And this is a really good place if you're in accountability, if you have something like covenant eyes and someone is... Uh, your accountability partner and gets your report, or you have a mentor, but to really just kind of say, what do I notice now that I've paid attention? Because most of us fly over our lives at about 25,000 feet, and you just can't see. It's not until we actually incarnate ourselves into our fantasy and into our story that the connections are really going to come uh, to, to be. Um, so when you will begin to do that, that's a lot of what I'm wanting you to link, is that a lot of our sexual fantasies end up being places that we can reverse a childhood dynamic or repeat a harmful childhood dynamic. And those are the connections that I want you to be most curious about. Um, so any questions about that? Yeah. yeah thank you, this is profound. Uh, you know, the statistics are correct. Kind of like the police suffer, but our wives suffer. Our wives. Our wives suffer. Yeah. Because more women have suffered sexual abuse growth than men, statistically. Yeah, one out of six men, one out of every three, four women. So, if, if there's a room of women, how different would this be exactly the same? Yes, yeah, very and similar. And then, what do you say, like, how does that, so how have you been married 30 years? How do you both unpack? All the crap before you do that. Yes. And you. <laughs> <laughs> they need at least two more words. Three simple steps. Three simple steps. Yeah. Well, I think that that's, that's what happens, right? So it, I'll just kind of go to a real story. Like Jonathan, right? Um, his wife was devastated when she found out about this. It, you need to tell where you've been. It, because, I mean, if you were betrayed, you would want to know, you would want to have the data. Um, from your spouse if they were cheating to be able to make that decision. And so she was devastated by his involvement with prostitution. Um, and uh, so one of the things that she really looked for is, is he actually going to have integrity? Um, so a lot of us as men, we tend to want to kind of blame certain things on our wife's lack of intimacy, uh, on difficult things that we're having in life instead of having to confront our two-choice dilemma. Usually we try and see things as interpersonal conflicts, which they are a lot of times, but that avoids the agony of choice. So Jonathan had to confront, this is my issue, not blaming parents, not blaming everything in the past, but he had to study those things in order to know it. And that's what he opened up to her about the session. I mean, I remember it just like it was yesterday. He wept when he saw the connection between his Schwinn bike at 13 to his SUV when he was 52. Um, and so that was something of the story that he brought to his wife is, not only have I had integrity with what I'm doing in the present, whether that's accountability, therapist, those sorts of things, but at some point, uh, just make her name up, Julie, 
uh, can we go to dinner in three months so that I can begin to share with you a little bit about my story? Um, and he said that that was basically the game changer in his marriage, is that he was able to grieve for the boy that was abused and left, and he was really able to grieve for the harm that he brought to his wife. And she, her seeing his tears uh, around his current sexual behavior and the wounds of his past, I mean, th their marriage is so beautiful now. Um, it is stunning to watch something that was so dead and broken become alive. But that's, I would say that's the work, is that you need to have integrity in the present. But then you also really need to have integrity to face things in your past that led to it. Because we, we study the past not to make excuses for our behavior in the present, but because narrative holds the key to unlocking all future change. You have to be a historian. Yeah. You, you talk about interviewing a lot of interviews. Have you worked with any couples and how they navigate um, the, the, their sexual abuse? Um, to and with each other yep. and perpetrating that on, yep. you know, because one yep. thing, for instance, you know, people don't realize it, but some withholding sex as punishment is a form of abuse that women use for men. And so where does that come from? And then mm -hmm. how do um, men deal with, yep. you know, the, the, the abuse? Yeah, so a couple of things. We'll talk about that. I'll talk about that some in the next session around the role of anger in, in that gridlock between a couple, because every couple... But part of what I would say is like a lot of this is sexual brokenness and evil. A lot of what we're dealing with with porn, infidelity, I would just say is like it, we know from the statistics it's everywhere. So this isn't just something that is, you know, fully sexual brokenness. We just have to confront difficult things about who we are in our marriage. <coughs> um, but what I would say to that dynamic is that uh, let's just say I'm working with a couple, a woman kind of says, I don't really feel desire for sex. Um, and then you do find out that there's some sexual abuse in her past. Um, part of what she feels conflicted about, right, is her desire. That there is a perpetrator that pursued her, saw something lovely, beautiful about who she was, wants her. She allowed herself to be wanted, and then abuse began to unfold. And so what happens in a marriage when a man desires her, wants her, actually reenacts the trauma cocktail, and her brain isn't something that she's consciously just saying, I'm trying to deprive you. She's just saying, I'm going offline. Um, and so that becomes part of the work of grief is, I mean, this is the, the language of blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Most men try to find some type of, they outsource their comfort to unwanted sexual behavior. Uh, sometimes women outsource it to more of their own relationships. They hide. Uh, but we, we all have to go, yeah. <laughs> we have to go back to those formative scenes of where something was stolen and taken from us. And then that becomes part of the, the marital conversation is, I mean, most of us, you need to be able to talk about sex as easily as you're talking about what you want for dinner. Um, so if you can't say, what type of sex do you want to have tonight? Let's, what do you think about this? Um, I remember when we did this like a month ago, there was something about seeing the beauty of your body there that, can we do that again? And so that becomes the conversation of something about me isn't quite present, right? And so that becomes the kind of consistent attunement of there is something about your desire that I know I can bless and it's good, but I'm leaving. And so that if a, if a man isn't so narcissistically wounded that he just checks out and gets angry, uh, but he says, like, basically, what can I do to reestablish safety? Do you need a massage? Uh, are there places that I can pursue you more? Or maybe we just do need to kind of talk through what's coming up for you. Uh, there's infinite amounts of ways that we can be kind and know our own story. Uh, but I would say that that's really so much of intimacy is knowing the places of harm and then being able to be attuned to that in an intimate moment with your spouse. So this is great. It's fascinating. I've probably come to some of these conclusions just over time. As a yeah. Um, but this drops me off at, okay, you're screwed up. <laughs> and this is why. Yeah. Okay, what's next? Like, how do, if it is about core childhood or, you know, adult or developmental things, yeah. how, how do we find healing for those core? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, that, that will be our last question because I just realized it's 1047. I think the next session starts right now. Um, but yeah, I, that's where I think a lot of uh, what I said earlier, like blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Um, and then the language of Psalm 131 that says like, just like a weaned child, like a weaned child is my soul within me. And most of us don't know how to regulate difficult things without moving towards unwanted sexual behavior. So I would say that there's a lot of just self, being able to confront yourself, to learn, I mean, I don't, you guys are mostly staying in the hotel. Does anyone know what the two, um, I was gonna call them flavors, but the, uh, the lotion, the shampoo, do you know what two basically flavors are inside? Something mint. Mint, anyone else know the other one? Lavender. No? Nope. Rosemary. So that's one of the things that I check out all the time whenever I travel, I'm in the hotel, is I look at the lotion and the shampoo. And I smell it, right? Um, so most of us try to suppress desire. I want to feel fully alive when I'm in a hotel room, right? So I come in and I feel the sheets and they're cool and I pick out my favorite pillow. And then I smell the lotion. Sometimes it's lavender, sometimes it's aloe, sometimes it's rosemary and mint, which it is today. And that becomes something of the process of healing is I kind of just puff the, <laughs> you know, the mint lotion. And I let that soothe me. I let that rest. And so most of us usually pursue, again, more alcohol. So I'm, I love scotch. My scotch <coughs> collection is amazing, right? Um, but how many Isla scotches do you need to really feel like you are in Lagavulin? Uh, the first one is phenomenal. You just waft it, and then I'm back on the shores of Isla, right? And so that, that's the point, is that we have to learn how to self-soothe and regulate in ways that bring goodness to our bodies, not just deprivation, because most of us know too much deprivation. And then secondly, I would just say we need to journey with others. So this isn't something that you just do on your own, but this is what your energy groups really should be doing. This is what accountability partners and friendships should be doing, is basically tell me your story about where you've been and where you want to go. Um, and so that's, that becomes the, instead of just like, Jay, you know, every Sunday night you tend to look at pornography, what's going on, uh, we get a sense of like what's actually playing out on Monday morning. Uh, or when a spouse is gone. Uh, so we really have to kind of step into what, what's the narrative, what's the story that we're in today, and how is that story that we're in today a reenactment, many ways, of what was in the past. So more this afternoon. Thank you. Very much.